Can we begin by turning to Isaiah chapter 2? Now those of you who were here in our last class, um, you'll remember that we established the fact that the best fit for the biblical nation of Tarshish was Britain. And uh, if you weren't here in the last class, then please uh, get hold of the recording to establish that. Um, We're not going to spend any more time on that. We're going to take it as given in this class that when we read of Tarshish, it is in fact Britain. And um, we looked last time, didn't we, at many of the the prophecies that would happen and occur just after the Lord Jesus Christ and just before the Lord Jesus Christ appears on the world scene to save Israel. Um, And now, God willing, what we hope to do is to pick up those threads and to continue forward looking at the role of Tarshish and Britain in the kingdom age, in the millennium and uh, beyond. And God has quite a specific role with Britain, a purpose which is recorded wonderfully in the prophecies of the Old Testament. Um, and we're going to look at, those, at that role in a few moments' time, God willing. But, but before Britain can be worked with by God, a humbling has to occur. Our nation, or the nation at least that we dwell amongst, is a very proud nation, brothers and sisters, and it must be humbled. So here in Isaiah chapter 2, for instance, we read um, in verse 1, the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, and it shall come to pass in the last days, the Hebrew there is the latter days, So this is the time period when the Jews have been regathered, that time period of Ezekiel 38, of Daniel 2 when the stone smites the image, of that time when the kingdom is established. This is this prophecy here now slots into those set of latter day prophecies. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of Yahweh's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. And all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. A prophecy, brothers and sisters, I'm sure we're all very familiar with. A wonderful scene, isn't it, of peace on the earth. But this is, as it were, the end picture first. There's certain things that have to occur before that wonderful, tranquil scene can occur. If you look, for example, at verse 11, it says, The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and Yahweh alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of Yahweh of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty, and upon everyone that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. You see, brothers and sisters, Humanism does not find a place in the kingdom of God. It is not man's rights that are put first. It is God's will that is put first in God's kingdom. And look what it says there in verse 16, a little later on, talking about the humbling. It says in verse 16, And upon all the ships of Tarshish, and upon all pleasant pictures, And the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and Yahweh alone shall be exalted in that day. So we see there that that God's judgments, God's affliction against the proud, is brought also specifically against the ships of Tarshish. It also mentions there the pleasant pleasant pictures, doesn't it? Which is a most uh, interesting phrase. Um, The word for pictures is apparently very, very difficult to translate. Um, It's the only place used in the the Bible. I've jumped ahead there, one second. 
Um, and the suggestion is, is that, well, Jesenius, who's a, who's a Hebrew expert scholar, says that it actually could be rendered the flag of a ship. And so some versions, if you've got another version on your lap, some versions translated as sloops or vessels, this pictures of desire. And so we're not, it's, it's, the meaning of that is somewhat um, distorted, but it seems to be connected, doesn't it, with the pride of Tarshish, probably its flag um, that's borne on its ships. And this really, brothers and sisters, is a massive warning for us, isn't it? Because this is how God sees the nation of Britain. It sees the, God sees the nation of Britain as a nation that is proud and lofty and needs to be bowed down before him, before his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, brothers and sisters, we need to recognize that, don't we? We live in a very precarious situation because we are living in the very nation that is these things are spoken about. Pride, loftiness, idols are mentioned in verse 18. A culture which is against God and God's ways. Let's have another reference. Let's turn over to um, Psalm 48. I'll get the slide right this time. Psalm 48. And we see again how that the scriptures tell us that Tarshish has to be humbled. That the ships of Tarshish in particular have to be um, taken out of the picture, so to speak. So it says there in verse 1, Great is Yahweh and greatly to be praised in the city of our God and the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. On the sides of the north, the city of the great king. God is known in her palaces for a refuge. So this is a, a picture of the future, brothers and sisters. A picture when Zion is uh, beautiful and glorious. And at verse 4 it says... For lo, the kings were assembled, they passed by together, they saw it and so marvel, and so they marveled, they were troubled and hasted away. And I think there we get a, a little picture of Armageddon, when the kings were assembled against um, Zion. And it says in verse 6, fear took hold upon them there, and pain as of a woman in travail. And so we get the idea of, of when Christ and the saints um, come down on the Mount of Olives and the Mount of Olives splits in two, as it tells us in Zechariah, and the pain and the anguish and the fear of the nations and the armies of Gog in that day takes a grip on them. But look what it says in verse 7. Thou breakest the ships of Tarshish with an east wind. And so we get a little glimpse here of again another little humbling of Tarshish in the same time period. We get a glimpse of an east wind which indicates that when uh, Russia comes down, the Gogian host comes down, the British ships perhaps in the Mediterranean are going to be destroyed by a divine hurricane. And so this incidentally would fit in with what we saw already, wouldn't it brothers and sisters, in Ezekiel 38 because the merchants that are joined to Sheba and Dedan in our last study all they could do was say, art thou come to take a spoil? It doesn't seem that they were in a position where they could actually resist um, in any kind of uh, meaningful way the invasion um, into that area. And so perhaps um, we're suggesting just before um, the Armageddon um, war battle that the ships of Tarshish are, are started to be humbled by a divine hurricane in that day. The lofty looks of man, brothers and sisters, shall be humbled, and particularly Tarshish. Now, before we go uh, any further, what we, uh, we thought might be worthwhile doing is just going through the sequence of events after Christ has returned. And you'll appreciate, brothers and sisters, each one of these is about five studies in its own right. So you'll have to just bear with me in regard to, to that. Um, so I just want to remind you of, 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 the, uh, of the normal understanding of, of how things work out. So the first is that obviously that Christ returns in secret to the saints. We're taken away out of the world um, to Sinai for the resurrection and the judgment, which occurs in private. The rejected are cast back out into the world, but the faithful remain with Christ for a time. 
And then during that, that time, um, still uh, the, the world is not, uh, does not really understand or know that Christ has returned, the Elijah mission occurs, mentioned at the end of Malachi, where it seems that the Jews are prepared to accept Christ as their Messiah. They don't accept it just at that point, they're just being prepared. And then um, Gog attacks, we've got Ezekiel 38 and the Armageddon prophecies, and so some of the Jews um, are scattered in that time when Gog comes down. It tells us in Joel chapter 3 that they're, they're sent out uh, and scattered, uh, and, but some remain in Jerusalem, don't they? Two-thirds are cut off, but there's a third that remains fighting to the death at that point. They're, they're on their last legs, and it looks like it's the end of Israel. And that's the very time when the Lord Jesus Christ appears on the scene. And you remember the words in Zechariah where it says, that they'll look on him whom they pierced and mourn. And so it seems at that point, it's when Israel are saved that the nucleus of Jews in Jerusalem accept Christ as their king as they witness the destruction of the armies of Gog. And then after that point, um, there's a decree that goes out for the nations to accept Christ. And we're going to look at aspects of that uh, and from point five onwards in our study uh, this evening. And then after the decree goes out, it seems, or, or during that time period, the, what's known as the second exodus, John Thomas calls it in uh, Elpis Israel, the second exodus of Israel, um, where they exit the nations that they've been scattered to and which they've, uh, some of them have lived in for years. And they come back um, to Israel and they're cleansed by God and accepted by him. And then this, uh, going, linking back to point five, after this decree has gone out, some nations accept the decree and join the kingdom uh, as subjects, accepting Christ as king of kings, but some uh, reject the principle, uh, the decree. And so those countries, uh, known as Babylon, um, are destroyed. The existing nations are given one last chance to accept Christ, um, before finally they are also destroyed, um, and so then peace on earth begins. And what this really tells us, brothers and sisters, is that the pop population of the earth is going to be greatly decreased, because there's not going to be a lot of people who are happy to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. And if, uh, incidentally, you're interested in, in that sequence of events, um, I can't do better than to recommend um, events subsequent to the return of Christ by Jim Cowie, who, who gives an introduction to that topic, particularly for young people. It's a cracking book to have on your bookshelf. So, there we go. That's the, the sequence. And as we've said, we'd like to uh, really pick up from point five onwards. I wonder if we could turn to Revelation chapter 14, which helps to just piece together this sequence. So you can see it's not just Brother Matt just um, coming up with some ideas, that there is some scriptural foundation, particularly to point five onwards, which is where we, uh, we left off in our last study. I think Revelation 14 is, um, is very good to help us with the sequence of events that occur. So in verses one to five, we read all about how in symbol, the Lord Jesus Christ has returned and the saints are with him. So if you look at that verse one, and I looked and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion and with him an hundred, forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. So we get the idea that this is Christ and the saints. And then there's a description of, of the saints there to verse five. So they, Christ has returned. He's on Mount Zion. And then the next thing that happens is in verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. So after Christ, has, after Armageddon, he's established his throne in Jerusalem with the saints. Now we get this decree that goes out. It's depicted here in symbol as a, an angel flying in the midst of heaven. And he's preaching 
the everlasting gospel to all the nations and he's telling them to submit to the rule of Christ and to fear God. So that's the, that next stage, isn't it? And in verse 8, we read of those nations termed Babylon, um, and it, it's implied that Babylon falls after that decree. So it seems that some nations reject the decree, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So Babylon rejects Christ and is also influencing other nations, and so for that is destroyed. And then we have verse 9 through to verse 10. Another warning for the nations. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So there's, this other, there's another chance for the peoples of the earth to accept Christ. And don't we just see in this, brothers and sisters, the mercy of God, how many chances he gives for them to wake up and to accept the new government of his son. And then in verse 11, we read of the final destruction and overthrow of those nations that reject that final plea. The smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. But what we want to really home in on, brothers and sisters, is this idea that the gospel is preached to the nations. The everlasting gospel, it says there in verse 6. What's the gospel got to do with? Well, there's two aspects, isn't there, brothers and sisters? I'm sure we're, obviously, we're all very familiar with, with the gospel. There's two parts to it. The things concerning the kingdom of God and the things concerning the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a bunch of references there on the screen which show that this is the critical point in the gospel message. Jesus went about all gallery preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages preaching the gospel of the kingdom. They, the disciples, asked Jesus after he'd risen, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? They believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. And in Acts 28, it says that Paul was preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ, with all confidence, no man forbidding him. So it's quite clear, brothers and sisters, that one of the crucial pillars of the gospel message is an understanding of the kingdom of God. The kingdom restored to Israel on the earth. This is the major aspect, isn't it, brothers and sisters? And, and in fact, it is, unfortunately, something I believe that our community is losing sight of. You see, our beliefs, brothers and sisters, they are far, far closer, are they not, to the Jewish belief, to the Jewish faith, than Christendom with its trinity, heaven going, and so on and so forth. And I think it's sad to say that we are slowly forgetting our connection with the Jewish hope. Alarming misunderstandings seem to be taking place. And we seem, unfortunately, to be being influenced by the idea that our community has somehow replaced Israel. The Jews, brothers and sisters, are God's people. Not because they were righteous, but because their fathers were faithful. And we are adopted Jews. We're heirs, it tells us in Galatians 3.29, of the Jewish hope, of the hope of Israel, Acts 28 verse 20, through Christ. We are called out of the Gentiles, it says in Acts 15.14. In other words, we are no longer Gentiles and we're grafted into the nation of Israel, Romans 11.24. And so, brothers and sisters, we are in fact adopted Jews, are we not? We should no longer identify ourselves with the Gentiles, but with the hope of Israel. 
And in the BASF, the Statement of Faith, clauses 21 and 22 deal a little bit with this. It says that, that one of our major beliefs is that the kingdom which he will establish, that Christ will establish, will be the kingdom of Israel restored. And clause 22 says that this restoration of the kingdom again to Israel will involve the ingathering of God's chosen but scattered nation, the Jews. Jews, brothers and sisters, are the principal nation and the kingdom is all about them. It is restored to them. And it's our hope, is it not, to be part of that restoration in that day. And that's the, at the heart of any true understanding of the gospel. And this is what's going to be preached to the nations, brothers and sisters, preached to Great Britain. They're going to be humbled and they will accept this teaching that Israel is God's kingdom and that the Lord Jesus Christ is Israel's king and that they need to become Christ's subjects and obey him as the king of kings. Turn over, please, to Zechariah chapter 12. We're all familiar with Zechariah chapter 12. It's that, that prophecy, another Armageddon prophecy, isn't it? In verse 3, it talks about how Jerusalem is going to be a burdensome stone in that day. And um, we read, um, don't we, later on in verse uh, 10, um, how that they will, the Jews, after Armageddon, will look upon me whom they pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one who mourneth for his only son. And then if you look at... Um, Verse uh, chapter 13, verse 1, we see in that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And so we see that, that the Jews in that day are accepted by Christ uh, and by God and their sin is forgiven. And if you flick over to chapter 14, um, we're going to come back here later in our study, but if you look at verse 9, you'll see where we're going with this. And Yahweh shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Lord and his name one. And so here we read, do we not, brothers and sisters, how that God is going to be king over all the earth. And the Lord Jesus Christ, who uh, bears God's name, is his representative in that day. Over all the earth, a worldwide rulership and kingdom. But have you ever really considered, brothers and sisters, how it's going to be accomplished? Because we have a great deal of information as to how it will happen. It's not just some sort of vague bump, then it's there. There's a process. Turn over to Daniel chapter 2. Let's just remind ourselves of a, of a few other uh, prophecies that will be familiar with you, brothers and sisters, but with, which gives us a couple of little insights into this time. Daniel chapter 2, look at verse, um, verse 35. It says right at the end, doesn't it, that the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So we get the idea that the stone grows to fill the whole earth. The kingdom brought about by the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, the king. It's not just a local thing. Look at verse 44. And in the days of these kings, the kings of the feet, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So this stone that hits the image grows, doesn't it, to fill the whole earth, and it gives us the idea that it spreads to the point where we read in Hebrews, uh, Habakkuk 2 rather, the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. So all the kingdoms, are, all the nations are going to accept this kingdom eventually. Turn to Daniel 7, a couple of pages on, and look at verse 13. 
Um, again, a little snippet in the visions of Daniel as to what the kingdom is going to be like. It says there, I saw in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. This is the return of Christ. Verse 14. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom and all people, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So again, we get this idea that, that all the nations, all the people, all the languages are going to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're going to accept his kingdom, which is the kingdom of Israel restored. And Britain is going to be one of the nations who accept Christ in that day. We've seen then, just from those bunch of references, that it seems that the kingdom starts from Jerusalem and grows, that the nations will still exist but serve Christ. It's a worldwide kingdom, and one of those nations is going to be Tarshish. Let's just uh, turn to that passage in Psalm 72. Another a wonderful psalm that I'm sure we're all very, very familiar with. Prophecy again of the time when the Lord Jesus Christ will return. It's wonderful, isn't it? What a privilege it is, brothers and sisters, for us to just flick back and forward and consider the great hope that we have and these, the, these prophecies that God has caused to be written for us. So, we should be at Psalm 72. Psalm 72, look at verse uh, 1. Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. He shall judge thy people with righteousness and thy poor with judgment. So we get the idea that this is the time when the king is back and his righteous judgments are going out to the earth. And look at verse 8. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea, and from the river unto the ends of the earth. So this is a worldwide kingdom at this time. Verse 10. The kings of Tarshish and of the isles shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. Yes, Britain is there, brothers and sisters. It hasn't been wiped out. It hasn't rejected Christ. In fact, the contrary. Here are the kings of Tarshish bringing gifts to Christ in that day, in that wonderful day when the kingdom's here. So they're going to come with a gift. What a transformation, brothers and sisters, of the British people. We have them depicted, don't we, in Isaiah 2 as this proud, lofty nation. And here we have them in humble subjection to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so like Tyre of old, they're going to be there with a gift. Like Tyre of old, um, they, Tyre was there when Solomon got married uh, in Psalm 45. And so here, the latter-day Tyre comes with a gift for Christ and his bride, the saints. But what does this gift consist of? And this is where hopefully you'll see where this study is going, because it ties, this gift ties right in with the everlasting gospel that's preached to the nations. Can we turn to Isaiah chapter 66? We're going to spend some time in Isaiah flicking through a few passages. And I, I find these uh, prophecies fascinating, brothers and sisters, because they give us a glimpse of what is going to occur in the future. And this one here particularly is very, very interesting. So here we are in Isaiah chapter 66. If you look at verse 15, this is the time when God's judgments are in the earth. It says, For behold, Yahweh will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind, to render his anger and with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword will Yahweh plead with all flesh, and the slain of Yahweh shall be many. As we say, there's not going to be many people in the kingdom in that sense as we know it today. The earth's population will decrease because many will reject God. And look at what happens in verse 18. For I know their works and their thoughts. It shall come 
that I will gather all nations and tongues and they shall come and see my glory. And I will set a sign among them and I will send those that escape of them unto the nations, to Tarshish, Pul and Lud, that draw the bow to Tubal and Javan, to the isles afar off, that have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. Now if we read that carefully, brothers and sisters, it seems to me to be saying that God gathers together the nations. And I think here, really, he's not talking about every single individual from the nations. It seems to imply that representatives of the nations are, are invited to Jerusalem to see God's glory. So ambassadors are sent to this government who's just destroyed half of the world's armies and has entrenched itself in Jerusalem. And so we can imagine these ambassadors coming to see the new government of Israel. And you can imagine their surprise, can't you, when they come to this government and this government asks them to submit to their king, that their king should rule over them. That they should bow down all sovereign rule and authority and give it to this government in Israel. And that this government, in fact, represents God and the king is the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know how God works. He doesn't just expect people to believe. He gives them a sign. Verse 19, I will set a sign among them. The word for sign means a miracle. So there is a miracle done to back up this message of glory which the nations um, get. And it seems then, brothers and sisters, if we read carefully, it seems that there are two groups in that time who witness that sign. It says, and I will send those that escape of them unto the nations. So it seems there's these two groups of ambassadors. There's those who accept and who escape to go back to their, their nation and to declare what they've seen. But there's those that don't escape. There's presumably because they reject the sign or they're not willing to entertain the possibility of submitting to Israel. Perhaps they're rude, flippant, aggressive. And so they do not escape, whatever that might mean. And so they don't go back to the nations. They don't go to Tarshish, Pul, Tubal, Java, to the isles afar off. And they don't go to those places that they came from to, to declare God's glory among the Gentiles. But it seems, though, that those nations there do uh, entertain the suggestion that they would accept this uh, new government. And particularly for our studies this evening, Tarshish. The ambassador of Tarshish seems to be one that escapes and he gets to go back to his nation. And look at what happens in verse 20. And they, this is those that have gone back to those nations, they shall bring all your brethren, Israel's brethren, for an offering unto Yahweh out of all nations, upon horses and in chariots and in litters, and upon mules and upon swift beasts, to my holy mountain Jerusalem, saith Yahweh. As the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of Yahweh. And this indicates, doesn't it, brothers and sisters, an acceptance of Christ. An acceptance of the gospel. An acceptance of the principal position of Israel and their king. As an acceptance that God has chosen Israel. And as we've said in Joel 3, Israel will have been scattered in Armageddon. So we're going to have Jews all over the world. And these Jews are to be regathered. And here particularly we're told that those nations, Tarshish is there, they're going to bring back the Jews to the land. And in verse 23 it tells us that eventually, at the end, all flesh shall come to worship before me, saith Yahweh. And in verse 24 we read another of those warnings, those judgments upon those nations who have rejected and they shall go forth, this is the flesh coming to worship God, they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. Perhaps 
the carcasses of the ambassadors who rejected um, the miracle are still there as a witness to those nations of people who reject God's gospel. And we know that that's picked up by the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament when he quotes from this very passage here about those who reject God's truths. And so we see then how the everlasting gospel might well go out to the nations, how perhaps representatives are gathered, taught the gospel, some reject and are destroyed, some accept, go back to their nations and then declare God's glory. And as a token of acceptance, the sign that they've accepted it is that they will help the Jews get back to Israel. Absolutely amazing, brothers and sisters. Turn to Isaiah 60, because Tarshish is definitely going to be one of those nations that accept these things. And again, you know, it's surprising, brothers and sisters, how much detail we actually have about the movements of Tarshish in this time period. And that's what we're saying. We think that there's a specific role for Britain during this time, which we'll come on to in a few moments. Isaiah chapter 60, again a vision of the glory of God. Look at verse 1 in the kingdom. Arise, shine, for thy glory is come, and the glory of Yahweh is risen upon thee. He's talking about Israel. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, and Yahweh shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Verse 3, And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. What a wonderful future vision, brothers and sisters. The idea, isn't it, of of, uh, the people being in darkness, and God's glory rising like the sun, illuminating um, the earth, and how all the nations of the earth come to Israel, They come to see Yahweh having been arisen upon Israel. And then we see, um, look at verse 3. It says, uh, sorry, verse 4. Lift up thine eyes round about and see all they gather themselves together. Then Gentiles are coming. They come to thee. Thy sons shall come from far and thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. Then thou shalt see and flow together and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. The forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. You see how Israel becomes this um, amazing place and all the Gentiles wish to be involved in bringing the sons and the daughters of Israel back to their land. Verse 9. Surely the isles shall wait for me, and the ships of Tarshish first to bring thy sons from far, their silver and their gold with them, unto the name of Yahweh thy God, and to the Holy One of Israel, because he hath glorified thee. So we see here that the ships of Tarshish are there first. So although some of the ships were destroyed, it seems there are some left who helped to regather Israel to help bring the sons of Israel there from far. And they're not only going to bring them, but they're going to give silver and gold. They're going to give over their wealth to Israel. And they're going to do it because God has arisen upon Israel and because the Holy One, because of the Holy One of Israel, which is, of course, a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 10. And the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls. So so Gentiles are going to come and help rebuild Israel. And their king shall minister unto thee. For in my wrath I smote thee, but in my favour have I had mercy on thee. Therefore thy gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day or not, nor night, that men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles, and that thy, their kings may be brought. If you look in your margin for forces, It's indicating that it's the wealth of Gentiles. So the doors of Israel are going to be open all the time because all the nations just keep coming with wealth to give over to God. And we've read, have we not, brothers and sisters, that Tarshish is there first. The British people accept. But look at verse 12. Again we get this solemn warning. For the nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. 
Yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. So if there is a nation that does not serve Israel, because that's the context of this passage, if a nation does not serve Israel, then they are going to be perished. They're going to be wasted. Quite a solemn thing. You see how Israel is the, cri is the critical issue in the kingdom age. It's what tests the nations. Do they accept Christ or not? And if they don't, we see there is some dire, um, dire issues that will come upon them. Can we turn over anyway to Isaiah chapter 18 and the passage that we had read for us um, just before um, we began by Brother Clive? And here we come across a very peculiar expression, don't we, brothers and sisters? The land shadowing with wings. So shall we just remind ourselves of this in verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 18? Woe to the land shadowing with wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, or the rivers of Cush, that sendeth ambassadors by the sea, even in vessels of bulrushes upon the waters, saying, Go ye swift messengers to a nation scattered and peeled, to a people terrible from their beginning hitherto, a nation meted out and trodden down, whose land the rivers have spoiled. All ye inhabitants of the world and dwellers on the, on the earth, see ye when he lifted up, lifteth up an ensign on the mountains, and hear, and when he bloweth a trumpet, hear ye. So what's this telling us then, brothers and sisters? Well, first of all, we have to consider who this, this um, nation is, the land shadowing with wings. And again, we get a very tricky word for shadowing. And I'm going to try and pronounce this in Hebrew, but bear with me, it's been a long day. So the, the word in the Hebrew is telatzel. And if you can see there, the Hebrew, there's actually uh, two Hebrew letters which are repeated. So you've got the, um, the Hebrew letters tsad and lamad repeated, both of them. And nobody really knows what this word actually means, to be honest. Um, I've looked at quite a lot of uh, trans different translations and different uh, scholars on this. But basically, it becomes quite complicated. It's interesting, if you just use the word, uh, I'm going to say it again, to sell, there, there's two, those two letters, that means shadow. And so what the translators have done is, because they don't understand what this really, really might mean, is the, the best bet is to say that it means shadowing. It's almost like shadow twice, kind of put together, a play on words, shadow, shadow, as it were, together. And so that's why they've done it like that. But, but it's interesting, brothers and sisters, that the same word is translated as symbol three times elsewhere, locust once, a fish spear once, and here, shadowing. And so it's a very confusing word. But the idea that I can gather behind the Hebrew is that it's the idea of being shadowed by a rapid movement. Um, and so this movement, you see, is also, can also cause sound, which is why it's translated symbol and, and locust, like an insect, a fish spear that tingles, uh, t tinkles, and so on and so forth. And so um, it seems to me that the word means a shadow or noise being caused by rapid movement. This land is, is, is very much in activity at this time. And if, you, um, if, if we had time, we, we haven't, you could look at um, just the word uh, cell, the word for shadow. And it's very interesting where it crops up in, in the Bible. It's definitely a, a metaphor for protection. So exa for example, Psalm 17 verse 8 Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. Psalm 36 verse 7. The children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. Psalm 57 verse 1. The shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge. Psalm 63 verse 7. In the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. And so the psalmist in all of those places is asking for God's protection. And so he uses this idea of being shadowed by God's wings, like God is protecting him from the heat of the day uh, and looking after him. And so, brothers and sisters, when we piece that together, this here is a land very, very busy with activity. And the activity of protection, that is the key thing. They're busy seeking to stretch out it, uh, their protecting wings, and it's like those wings are tinkering and buzzing with excitement. And activity. 
What about the next bit, which says that this land is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia or Cush? Well, for that we need to, to do a bit, of, um, a bit of digging. Keep a hand in Isaiah, and if we can flick back to Genesis chapter 10, we'll uh, see if we can uh, just have a quick look at this. Genesis 10, we actually have looked at in every single one of our classes. It's that table of nations that is outlined, outlined there. All the races of the earth are depicted in terms of, the, uh, of their relation with Noah. So Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And they're here. And if you look at verse 8, we read there, And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, whereof, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Verse 10. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erek, and Akkad, and Elner, in the land of Shina. So we read that, the, that this is where Cush initially settled. And I say initially because he does move. So Cush initially settles here in the area of Babylon, Babel. And um, he sets up, doesn't he, that rival system that rivals godly worship um, and that uh, God then comes down to to destroy uh, by setting languages amongst the people who were building that rival temple, which we believe it was, uh, the Tower of Babel. However, we can't just uh, say that, that is where Cush is because he emigrated, his descendants did, over this way, along with all the other um, descendants of Ham, as we saw in our last class. So um, some of the uh, other descendants of Ham, mentioned in verse 6, Mizraim, Foot, and so on, they came to these areas here, Egypt and Libya. And so there's a western Cush on this side, uh, which we know today as maybe modern Sudan, Ethiopia territory in, in northeast Africa. So, brothers and sisters, we really have two territories that we can identify with the land of Cush. And interestingly, it tells us, doesn't it, brothers and sisters, that this is um, going to be, this prophecy, if we flip back to uh, Isaiah chapter 18, is going to deal with a land which is beyond the rivers of Cush. So we've got a river there, that's the river Euphrates, the principal river of the eastern Cush territory, and we've got the river Nile, which is the principal um, river of the western Cush territory. And so we're being told that this particular land, wherever it might be, is beyond the rivers of Cush. That's the, the only kind of main clue. It could be anywhere outside of there. Now I'm going to suggest to you that it's Britain um, because of some of the events that take place here that tie in with our other prophecies. I'm not dogmatic on it, but I am going to suggest that. So let's have a, have a quick look at that. If you look at verse 2, it says that the, this river, uh, sorry, this land that's beyond the rivers of Ethiopia sends ambassadors by the sea. So it's a maritime power. Again, we see a little connection there. Even in vessels of bulrushes. Um, interestingly, isn't it, uh, that in uh, Exodus chapter 2 and verse 3, Moses is made that uh, ark of bulrushes. And it's the same word, that ark which was of a salvation to him. And so I'd suggest that the meaning here is that these vessels that go out of the land shadowing with wings are carrying a message of salvation. And then if you look at verse um, 2, again, we're told that they go to a nation scattered and peeled, whose land the rivers have spoiled. In verse 7, this is clearly Israel. That's identified as Israel, the land which has been scattered and peeled, and the people that have been scattered from that territory. And we come on to verse 7 in a minute. So they send out messages to Israel, but not just to scattered Israel. Look at verse 3. All the inhabitants of the world and dwellers on the earth. So they're sending out these ambassadors from this land, wherever it might be, to all the inhabitants of the world. And what are they saying? What's the message from this nation? See ye, when he lifted up an ensign on the mountains, and when he bloweth a trumpet, hear ye. In other words, I believe this is saying that the nations should accept Christ. The ensign. Isaiah 11 verse 10 says, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, 
which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. The ensign is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the banner behind which the nations must flock. And there's a trumpet, the jubilee trumpet, the era of a new beginning in the earth. What a message, brothers and sisters. Imagine the British Parliament doing that. They get their ambassador back. He explains what's happened, shown the sign and the miracle. And so the British people um, accept that. And so they then um, send out these ambassadors to the rest of the world, to their allies, perhaps. Um, It seems impossible, does it not, brothers and sisters? But here, I believe, we have an indication of this through God's prophets. And in verses 4 to 6, which we're not going to look at, we have the analogy of judgment, uh, which the prophet outlines. And the idea is is that that just before harvest, um, the rubbish bits of the crop are cut off. And so the indication is is that those nations that don't look to the ensign, that don't hear the trumpet, are going to be cut off. And then in verse 7, we get that connection again with our study. In that time shall the present be brought unto Yahweh of hosts of a people, scattered and peeled, and from a people terrible from their beginning hitherto, a nation meted out and trodden underfoot, whose land the rivers have spoiled to the place of the name of Yahweh of hosts, the Mount Zion. And that connects with all those other prophecies that we've seen of the people of Israel who had been scattered, being brought back to as an offering, as a present to um, God. And so, what's life going to be like for Britain after they've accepted Christ? What's it going to be like for our neighbours and the people we pass in the street? Well, of course, we're going to have righteous judgment, are we not, brothers and sisters? In Isaiah 42, it tells us this, that that, that Christ is going to bring judgment to the Gentiles. And in verse 4 of that chapter, it tells us that the isles shall wait for his law. They're looking for guidance from Christ. It says in Isaiah 26, verse 9, that when God's judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. So there's this teaching aspect. The people are going to be taught about God's ways. And in Revelation chapter 15, verse 4, again, just a snippet, just popped in, just a little detail. All nations shall come and worship before thee, Christ, for thy judgments are made manifest. So it's wonderful, isn't it, brothers and sisters, that Christ is going to have that authority and judgment is going to be righteous. We're not going to have any problems with law like we have now. And there's some indications, brothers and sisters, that the saints are going to rule with the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Indications, we've not got anything absolutely clear cut, but remember in Matthew 19, verse 28, the Lord Jesus Christ says to the disciples that they're going to sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And so the idea is is that that's Israel. They're going to be judged by the saints, by those 12 apostles. But what about the rest of the world? Surely they also will have different saints who are placed over them. And, And that's the idea in Luke 19 of that parable of the faithful stewards, of the faithful few. In fact, let's just turn there to Luke chapter 19. In Luke chapter 19, we get that parable, don't we, of the pounds. Different pounds are given to various people. And it's interestingly, in terms of the reward, what occurs. There's different degrees of reward, isn't there? And so, um, I'm just trying to find it. I haven't got my verse up there. It talks about different cities. Um, if If you look there, different cities are given to different ones. What was that, sorry? Verse 17, wonderful. Yes, that's perfect. And he said unto him, well done, well thou good uh, servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, have thou authority over ten cities. So there's different degrees of reward, and and the indication is, is different degrees of, of rule in the kingdom, perhaps, at that point. So the saints, it seems, might be helping to rule. So there might be a saint over Britain, at that time. And it says, doesn't it, in Psalm 149, verse 2, that the saints are going to have the honour of executing 
the judgment written upon the nations of the earth. They're going to bind kings in, in fetters of chains and so on and so forth. So it seems there's going to be saints over the nations. And, and here's a very, another very clear indication of that. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, um, an exhortation to us as well, brothers and sisters, that might be worth um, dropping in as we go past, about not going to law... And it says there in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? So we're supposed to sort out our differences using God's word as, a, as the rule. Can we flip back to Isaiah chapter 30 this time? And again, this, the context of this is Israel again, but we're, we're looking at this as a principle um, as to how the nations might be governed in the age to come. If you look at verse 20, it says, Though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner any more. But thine eyes shall see thy teachers. And this is talking about a future time when Israel will see the teachers of God. And in verse 21 it says, And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it, when ye turn to the right hand and when ye turn to the left. And so it, perhaps one of the roles of the saints is to help guide the, the, um, the mortals to do the right thing, to walk in the right ways. So we're suggesting then that life in Britain in the age to come might be like that, that the saints, there might be a few saints, perhaps some of us sitting here, perhaps, um, who will help the mortals of Britain to teach them God's correct ways. Here's another one that's uh, interesting to consider. Turn over to Ezekiel chapter 38. I just wanted to consider how the earth is going to be in the age to come. You know, how do we imagine it, brothers and sisters? Do you imagine cars and aeroplanes flying around, text messages and all that kind of thing? Well, I certainly don't, brothers and sisters, and I really do not hope that it's going to be anything like that. In fact, we know it's not going to be like that because if you look here in Ezekiel chapter 38, we get an indication of the impact of Christ's return. It says there in verse 20, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my God's presence. And the mountain shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. And we know from Zechariah that the feet of Christ and the saints, they touch the Mount of Olives, don't they? And it splits in two. And so we get this amazing earthquake which ricochets around the world. And incidentally, that, of course, as, as we probably know, Mount of Olives is right on that fault line. And so there's going to be a major earthquake in the earth. So that one wall, we say, every wall, it says there, shall fall to the ground. Now we know what happened in Japan when there was an, a little tremor of an earthquake just off the coast with the power stations there. So what's it going to be like when we get a major catastrophe like this? Well, what's going to happen is, is there's going to be no more electricity. There's going to be no more power stations because there's going to be no more walls that are stood up. And so nature, brothers and sisters, is going to be reset. Every wall is going to fall down. And so this is going to begin a new era in world history. It's going to go back to rely on God and not technology. It's going to be healthy people. The inhabitants shall not say, I'm sick. The blind are going to see and the deaf are going to hear. The child is going to die in 100 years. And the earth is going to be incredibly fruitful. The plowman, it says in Amos, doesn't it, shall overtake the reaper. And so we get an idea that, that in the kingdom there's going to be this culture of farming. There's going to be this getting back to nature, so to speak, where men are going to go and plow the field as they used to do. And you know, brothers and sisters, I, can't, I, I, I think that's wonderful. I mean, the era that we live in is not natural, is it? It's full of radio signals, of screens, of channels, of text messages. 
So, so much so that my head hurts some days when I get 200 odd emails, I get 50 odd calls, I can't cope with the amount of communication and nonsense that we have to, to deal with in the modern world. I don't know about you. And so it's lovely, isn't it, to think that this is how man was created to live, having time to watch his crops and to consider godly things, time which we desperately need in our age at the moment. And people think that they would be, that they're happier now. But I wonder, with the simplicity of a simple farm life, perhaps maybe we'd all be a little bit happier. But um, that's just me dreaming a little bit. So there we go. So here we go. When, what else can we gather about life in Britain in the age to come? A couple more things. Um, there's going to be definitely a national law to be followed. Um, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, you'll remember it talks about Christ, the seed of David, um, setting up a temple. And a house of prayer for all people is mentioned in Isaiah 56, verse 6 and 7, that's going to be set up. And in that uh, section, it also talks about people um, obeying the law of the Sabbath and bringing burnt offerings to the temple. And so all the nations are going to go to that temple to worship and to fulfill God's national law. Um, in Ezekiel 40, we get the uh, picture of the great temple in the age to come. And burnt offerings are mentioned there in verse 39 of chapter 40. Burnt offerings which will point back to what the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished and will teach God, uh, man about sin and how God views sin. And in Isaiah chapter 60, we get the indication that the Gentiles are going to come and offer on God's altar, and those offerings are going to be accepted. Perhaps we could turn to Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14 talks about how the nations are going to interact with God in the age to come, how they're going to worship Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which come against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, Yahweh of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So it seems every year the nations are going to go to Jerusalem to worship God. And of course the British are going to be amongst them. Tarshish, the nation of Tarshish are going to go to Jerusalem to worship God, to keep the feast of tabernacles. And it says um, in verse 17, and it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, Yahweh of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, that have no rain, there shall be the plague, wherewith the, with, with Yahweh will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And so we get the idea then that there's a punishment if the nation does not come to pay homage to God by, um, by worshipping at the temple year to year. And it's interesting, isn't it, that, that God still sees the nations as nations. There's Egypt there, and they're punished as a nation if they don't come up. And there's other nations, other families of the earth, which are punished if they don't come up uh, individually. And so although they're all under the rule of Christ, they retain their national identity. Well, let's have one last reference in connection with this. Uh, Micah chapter 4. And we're going to end our considerations of Britain particularly in regard, uh, in relation to this passage. Micah chapter 4, a wonderful passage to think about. But, it, but in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of Yahweh shall be established in the top of the mountains. And it shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh and to the house of the God of Jacob. And, we will, and he will teach us of his ways. And we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. The nations, brothers and sisters, the British people, those that are around us perhaps today, will go up to learn the ways of God. 
And so there we're going to leave our considerations of Britain in Bible prophecy. But we have one final thing to do. We have to consider the lessons for us before we close. What are the lessons for us? Well, perhaps this is our last reference for our studies, and it's in Hebrews chapter 11. What are the lessons for us? Well, clearly, brothers and sisters, it's an encouragement to us to witness to those around. Imagine the shame, brothers and sisters, that, uh, that would follow if one of our neighbours or work colleagues who accept Christ in the kingdom age see us in the kingdom. And they say to us, why didn't you ever tell me about this amazing hope that you had? You know, it's just unthinkable, isn't it, that that would perhaps occur. And so I think we have to be encouraged to witness to the hope of the gospel now. Some might not believe or want to find out more now. They might not gain a complete understanding of the gospel to become responsible. But perhaps by, by preaching where we can, it might enable them to accept the full gospel when Christ returns and that decree goes out to the nations. So that's one thing we can take away with us. What about um, um, a warning? Well, we've seen, haven't we, that Britain is proud and lofty. The society we live in needs humbling. God's word should be humbling us now. And so we should stand aside, should we not, from that proud society, from its entertainments, from its humanism, from its media, and try our best to focus on God's ways. And finally, we've seen from the scriptures, haven't we, in in all our other studies, our faith affirmed, our confidence renewed. I'm hoping that uh, there's no doubt in our minds as we go away from these studies that God does exist, that the angels are at work, that we can look out into the world and see prophecy fulfilling before us. Britain's separation from Europe, the the formation of the nations of Ezekiel 38. We saw it in the past with Britain being used by the angels to fulfill Daniel 11 and the role of the king of the south and the drying up of the river Euphrates and the restoration of Israel uh, and those prophecies in our first study. We're seeing it in the present as the angels are arranging world affairs as we've seen in the prophets such as Ezekiel 38. And we see it in the future where, and, and these things give us confidence, don't they? In those prophecies that have not yet been fulfilled. That those prophecies that are going to occur of the humbling of Britain and its role in the kingdom age to regather Israel back to its land after the scattering of Armageddon. We should all be in Hebrews chapter 11. Look at verse 13. Let's gain inspiration from these words. Let's not be patriotic to the country we live in, for, our, for we look for something far greater than anything this world can offer. Verse 13. These, the faithful, all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is an heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Although the British will accept Christ in the future, we have already accepted him, brothers and sisters. And so we should be living now in newness of life, as if we are citizens of the kingdom already. So let us then be strangers from the society around us. Let us come out from among them and be separate. Let us not waste our time in frivolities and screen watching. Let us stand firmly on the side of God's ways and not man's. Not with the godless people of Britain who are haughty and need to be humbled, but with our Lord Jesus Christ. And so then, brothers and sisters, let us wait as strangers and pilgrims, watching world events, studying our Bibles, helping each other and waiting patiently for that better heavenly country that God has prepared. The time is short. Let us be ready.